So I have started the recording. So good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, June the 1st, and welcome to our first post Open Aperio 2016 teaching and learning meeting. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm with the University of Virginia, and together with all of you guys, since this is a roundtable discussion, I will be facilitating this meeting. So welcome to those of you who have been with meetings with us in the past. Welcome to those of you who are new. And we're excited to have a little discussion about things that we learned from Open Aperio, uh, things that we can share with those of us who were not able to attend this year. I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Plus, Terry Golightly gets double the say because she is listed twice in the user list. So that's even better. So before we dive in here and get started, if there are any project leads on the call that want to share any updates, I know Neil is on the call and he may want to share some updates about our upcoming Sakai 11 release. So any project leads, if you want to dive in, please feel free. Uh, sure, I can. This is Neil. I can uh, give a quick update on um, Sakai 11 uh, from the core team meeting yesterday. It sounds like we will have a beta um, this week. Uh, we are actually, the core team expressed um, some optimism about the release because we're pretty far along with blockers, but we still have a few blockers that need to get verified before they're merged into the 11 branch and still a couple of things that are in progress to get fixed. So that's why we're not quite ready for an RCO1. So there was actually a debate about whether to go for an RCO1 or not. And since we... Uh, you know, I've been talking about doing a beta for uh, two or three weeks now. They decided to go forward with a, with a beta. So we should have a beta later this week, and, there's, and they sound like there's still a good chance we could get a uh, RCO one out, um, you know, in June, or maybe get, you know, the release out in June. Uh, so that's the, that's the goal. Um, and uh, just curious if there's any questions, if that, you know, about the process. That's awesome. Thanks for that update, Neil. Any comments or questions about that as we approach our upcoming beta release of Sakai 11? Anybody have anything they want to sound off on the mic or in the chat? Um, Neil, this is Trisha. I was just, um, the blockers that are pending, are they waiting for fixes or fixes have already been done or and they just need um, testing? I have to look at, you know, I believe that there's a, there's a few that need testing. There's like five, there was like 10, and but I think already half of the blockers that were in the queue to be tested have already been tested and merged in. So I think there's like five, five blockers and four criticals that need testing. I think there's around 27 issues that need testing to get into the 11 branch. And I think there's still a couple of blockers that they're working on, so they haven't quite fixed, but they're uh -huh. getting getting pretty close. Okay, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, I mean, what we're anticipating actually another blocker being open that's uh, set a QA node out earlier, which is that um, the exception handling me mechanism in Samago, where you can uh, allow a student to take a test beyond the class time frame. Um, we think it probably will have a bug with respect to the auto submit feature. So we're trying to get the auto submit feature to be tested so we can confirm, and that would be a blocker, an additional blocker bug that's likely to be opened um, that we can anticipate. So that, um, but it does seem like the rate at which uh, bugs are coming, being reported and the rate at which we're identifying blockers is significantly slowing down and the rate at which things are going, getting fixed compared to that is, is going up. Oh, what's a blocker? Uh, yeah, so a blocker, uh, Terry, it's uh, it's a priority. Um, we pr uh, prioritize all the bugs that are reported. Uh, they go from trivial, minor, major, critical, and blocker. And um, we have an actual definition. It's not completely subjective. Um, we do have a definition. I can paste in the, the link to for our Confluence page. It defines what a blocker is. But essentially, blocker priority means we wouldn't we wouldn't release. Uh, Sakai 11 in, unless that was fixed. And ultimately, yeah, we get take input from, from teaching and learning, but ultimately the core team usually makes that determination. I'm going to find that, that uh, 
Confluence page because there is a definition. It's, I'm not making it up off the top of my head. Contrary to what people think, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Sakai Jira guidelines, I believe is the name of the page. There we go. Here is the link. Yeah, I mean, it's true, Laura, people can wiggle it, and the priority um, approach does change. So, for example, once we release an RCO1, so an RCO1 means release candidate. First release candidate, it means that we believe there are no blocker bugs, that we've, we've addressed the team, the community has addressed all the blockers, they're all fixed, they're all ready to go. And then if something's reported um, during an RCO1, it takes a lot for it to be considered a blocker because at that point we're really trying to push the release out. So our kind of the standards um, um, do change, and you know, because because almost always you can find another bug as as you're going through the release process, then you never get the release out. So it has to be something. It has to be more impactful. Uh, some of the blocker bugs that have been fixed, um, honestly, if we had been in into an RCO one, we probably would not have fixed. We would have just um, had them as be known issues on the release. Awesome, Neil. Thanks for that recap of where we are right now in terms of our final preparations for the release of Sakai 11. And thanks for that clarification from you and from Laura about what exactly we mean when we talk about what blockers are. Sometimes we use this terminology so much that we forget that there are people that don't always use that terminology in their everyday lives at their own institutions. So that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Anybody else who wants to give any other kind of project updates or reports before we dive in and start sharing our thoughts from the conference? <laughs> Neil makes a comment in the chat, don't get me started on master versus trunk. That's a good point. Let's not talk about that because I'm already confused just thinking about it. <laughs> We could take an update from uh, from marketing or from farm, um, and those also were were two discussions. This is Laura Geckler from the University of Notre Dame. Hello, those who may not know my voice. Uh, we could take an update from those two projects. They were also key parts of the conference, so that could go either way, Matt. Absolutely, Laura. I think that's a great idea. Um, for those of you who were part of that large main presentation that included some discussion of marketing, Laura, do you want to share anything that came out of that session? I did not. Although I'm part of the marketing team, I don't believe I was in the marketing session. So if someone was in the conference marketing session, they, they might be a better spokesperson. Uh, I can tell you about some of the work that we did up to it. Tricia, were you in the session? I I don't think I was. Gosh, it's terrible that I can't even remember. <laughs> I was only last week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a stab together then of what we know. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, one of the key goals of the marketing group has been to provide tools for those who uh, need to promote Sakai at their own institution or perhaps are invited to talk about Sakai at another institution. And we even talked about forming a speakers bureau of volunteers who would be willing to talk at other institutions who maybe are looking at um, making a change at their institution or just validating their current choice or for whatever reason they may need to know more about Sakai. So that was the Speakers Bureau. And then, um, and toward that end, we uh, put together a brochure. The brochure got published, didn't it? It did. Um, and it was disseminated to individuals at the conference, but... Um, uh, well, and I, I think at least the members of the marketing have a digital copy of that. I'm not sure if the plan is to make that available off of the Sakai Project website, probably. Um, 
you know, as a printable um, version. Right. Uh, Right. We also we also discussed um, putting together two different versions. One for more technical people who want to know what standards does Sakai comply with and what technology it's built on, and another one for a more general audience of of administrators and faculty and instructional designers, perhaps who don't really know what open source is or what kinds of advantages it might give them or what the strength of the community is. Mm -hmm. And it was suggested, and I think this plan is being put into effect to make a print version of the really cool video that um, Kyle Blythe put together um, about Sakai 11 as, um, as that brochure for the more general audience. And that really was the crowning achievement of the marketing group. When Kyle stepped forward to do that, we have such a cool video. I don't know if how many of you here have seen it or if we want to put a, a link in um, to chat, but it is just, go ahead. I think we should get an idea. Has any of the people on the call not seen the video? Would you like to see it? It's not very long. I'm sure Matt or anybody could could share. Yeah, that's the link. We could. Um, so if anybody has not seen it and would like to take a moment to watch it now, we could share it. And just like the video was created for use by our institutions, we got so excited about it here at Notre Dame that even though we're not going live with Sakai 11 until August the 2nd, uh, because of the existence of this video, we're sort of stepping up a notch our own internal promotion of Sakai 11. So that's really cool. That's great. Laura, are you guys... Um you said you're you're already using the video to promote um, your move to Sakai 11. The well, we're changing our promotion plan. Yeah, okay. so it it's um uh, right now it's being vetted or not even vetted really, but we we're previewing it with mm -hmm. the the people in the know. Sort of the yeah, we have yeah. a guy we have a guidance council here and our CIO and our provost's office of digital learning um, and then and then hopefully they love it so much this is kind of a um, stealth campaign right hopefully they love it mm -hmm. so much that they'll send it in a link of email to their colleagues so maybe it'll even go viral on our campus without us putting out our normal right that's kind of what we're <laughs> what we're playing with here yeah it's really cool we just really love it it is a really cool video. So if any of you have not seen it, um, the link is right there in the chat and you should definitely take a moment to, um, after our, our call, if nothing else, and check it out and you'll see what we mean. And as Neil points out in the chat, French subtitles are available, which is exciting. <laughs> so if French is your preferred minute. language, that's available. Yeah. And Spanish is also coming soon. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you, Laura, and thank you, Tricia, for giving us some more updates about the things that the marketing group has been up to. You guys totally crushed it. Um, I might add just one thing to that, which is that Kyle Blythe from NYU, who really has been spearheading a lot of the work that we have done in the marketing group, has also been soliciting some user stories that we are hopefully going to use in the future as the Sakai Project website goes through a refresh or a redesign. And Kyle and Neil and our vendors that we work with on the Sakai Project website have done a really great job about being really responsive to some of the comments from this group and some of the comments of the marketing group about things we might like to change or things we might like to update. And if any of you all have user stories from your institutions that you might like to share, stories about your work with Sakai, uh, how that has been helpful for your institution, how that has been transformative for your institution, those would be really, really great things to share. And I know that Neil and the marketing group and all of us 
would really welcome those. Tricia and I have worked up something for UVA, and I would be happy to share that with anybody if you guys want to see that, just to get an idea of what some other schools have done. And as Neil points out, user stories are easy to add uh, to the new site once it goes live. Tricia asks in the chat if that site redesign has gone live. Neil, do you know if it has, and if not, when it might be going live? Okay. Neil comments that it is live right now. So our refreshed Sakai Project site has also gone live, and you guys should definitely check that out. Uh, Kyle and Neil and our vendor team put a lot of work into that, and that effort is really ongoing. So we want to hear more feedback about that. And as Laura points out in the chat, the story that Trisha and I put together for UVA is also available there. You can go to the URL for the user story page that Laura just pasted into the chat. There's also something short from Duke, and there's also something uh, from Oxford uh, and from some other schools, and hopefully from your schools eventually down the road. So as Neil points out, uh, different voices are welcome, different links, different focuses. All of those things um, are welcome. So if you guys are interested in that, if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to email me offline or Neil um, or Tricia or Laura or anybody who has been involved with the marketing group. So that's a little bit about what marketing has been doing. Uh, anybody who attended the farm meeting who might like to talk a little bit about uh, some farm projects that might be on the horizon. For those of you who aren't familiar with farm, Farm is a relatively new initiative <clears throat> excuse me, that we have put together um, to try and allow institutions to pool some resources, to pool some financial and other resources to work on individual particular uh, projects. Um, so anybody who uh, went to the farm meeting, you might want to talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure I was at the farm meeting per se, but I did see a presentation on um, a proposed farm project that I got really excited about when I saw it. Um, it was on um, a resources tool enhancement project, and it would include things like a pre uh, document review feature, um, accessibility improvements and several other things. Um, of course, I can't remember all the details now, but um, it, uh, NYU, Kyle and Jeff were proposing it at the, con at the presentation at the conference, and um, it is on the list of farm projects. And so I believe the intent is that um, uh, different institutions using Sakai might become <clears throat> interested in helping to fund certain projects that resonate with them, such as this resources enhancement project, and it's being proposed for Sakai 12, FYI, um, and would contribute funds and or other resources to the effort of um, making those improvements. So um, it's actually a very exciting way for the community to have real influence over the direction of specific tools and other features in Sakai. So it's it's pretty exciting. And that reminds me of something else, Tricia. I was uh, at an ad hoc meeting um, that was called by Eric from the Uniform Health Services. Um, it's a military med school and they use Sakai, he uh, was interested in getting community feedback about some changes that, that would help them that they, their faculty have been asking for um, on the tests and quizzes tool. And a number of us showed up, including uh, Chris Schauer from um, Texas State, right? And uh, we, had, we had different approaches. His goal was to see what we thought of their suggested enhancements. And uh, some of us had the goal of saying, you know, maybe it's time to build another assessment engine. And uh, that's the reason I mentioned Chris Schauer, because he was uh, telling us that Texas State, yeah, Trisha, right? Um, he was telling us that Texas State has also been following this line of thinking, and they are just 
imagine that you see my fingers now with my index and thumb finger like two millimeters apart. They are that far from um, building their own assessments engine. And I mention this right now because there's an aspect of the funding and resource management um, website that I think is super cool. Um, one thing it does, and I'm going to paste a link in here, uh, is it provides a place that's not a JIRA, which is JIRA is kind of technical and old school and hard to sort and all that. Um, but it provides a place for anybody to have an idea or a project they think they want to start or just something they want to make visible. You know, like one of those things you dream about at night and you go, oh, and then you forget it in the morning before you write, write it down. Well, this is a place to write it down and see if anybody comments or votes on it. Uh, I should warn you, though, and Neil will pipe in if I don't say this, that there is still some conversation about this page on the license that we're using for this user voice and whether we could get a more enterprise. <laughs> Do you want to say this part, Neil? <laughs> you can go ahead. Nope, you didn't turn your mic on. OK, I'll keep rattling on. Uh, Anyway, if you look there, you will see that there already are some. And this is a perio farm, right? It's not just Sakai. So anybody can, um, anybody from any of the communities, any of the projects, and it doesn't have to be a software project either. It might be, um, you know, the Zerte folks say, uh, you know, we'd, we'd like to have our own marketing. And, you know, maybe that bubbles up into a perio marketing more than Sakai marketing or, or whatever. I'm going to shut up now so others can comment. No, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Tricia and Laura, for talking to us a little bit about farm. This is a great idea. As Laura points out in the chat, they have a video also, which you're welcome to watch, with the disclaimer that this one is goofy. Um, so feel free to check that out as well. I personally think this is a great idea that allows the community to do some of the best things about the community, which is pool their resources in order to make the tools that we all know and love and use every day a lot better, which is great. One other <laughs> farm project that um, I heard about, and I did not see this session either, but I heard about um, a farm project to add rubrics to the gradebook in G tool. Um, so that's another exciting possible development project out there that um, people might be interested in checking out. That one's on a different page. It appears that if you check, if you click on farm enhancement projects, you find the projects that are already pharmacized. I don't think pharmacized works. <laughs> Far Pharma, far, I don't know. Anyway, the native rubrics, rubrics one they're, you're talking about. Yeah, is on there. Farmalized. Oh, that's excellent. I love it. They've been farmalized. <laughs> See, you guys are laughing, but in Kentucky, where I'm from, that's actually how they say that word. So that's already a real word. <laughs> So that's great. Go. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, that is really helpful. And for those of you who are not familiar with that page or that video, I really encourage you to check those things out um, and see what kinds of projects people have proposed and what kinds of projects might be helpful or interesting to your own institutions. OK, one other thing, because I just noticed it on the farm enhancement project page was the rally project that's the accessibility group i know that they already had um, an external vendor assess sakai for accessibility and have a report on that now um, and i tiffany who works here at uda with me and matt um, reported us yesterday that sakai is about 75 percent accessible and then the other 25 percent i think that's pretty good actually um, a lot of problems in Samago, no surprise there. Um, some in assignments, and I think some with the drag and drop uh, file upload and resources, um, and a couple of other things. 
Um, so there is a project there to um, also address the issues that were identified. Awesome. Thank you, Tricia, for pointing that out. I did get to speak very briefly with Matt Clare from Brock University outside of Toronto, who is one of the folks who has really been working a great deal on Sakai and accessibility. And he seemed pretty pleased with that initial report um, and he felt pretty good about it. So that's good. So maybe at this point we want to just dive in. I know that several of us on the call, myself, uh, Laura, uh, Tricia, I believe Salwa, maybe a couple others, were able to attend Open Imperial last week. It was great to see all of you guys in person um, and get to match voices with faces um, and spend time with all of you. But I know that all of you, like I did, really got to see some great sessions and got the opportunity to get really excited about some of the things that other institutions are doing um, and some of the things that may be coming down the pipeline uh, for Sakai 11 or even Sakai 12, as Tricia mentioned, we got to see a great presentation about resources and what might be coming with resources in Sakai 12. So for those of you who were there, um, I wonder if we could just go down the list um, and invite you guys to dive in and maybe share some thoughts uh, from some of the sessions that you attended, some things that really stood out to you, some things that you really liked, or even if you feel so inclined, some things that you wish we had done or some things that you might like to do differently at Open Aperio next year. Um, so Laura, you're first on my list. If you want to dive in and just share some thoughts, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, with Salwa's con uh, comment here in mind, because um, we have met Facebook to face several years ago. And um, I think uh, I think from her perspective, it's always good for me to have a face in mind when I'm talking. So uh, I've seen some of you more recently, but Salwa didn't make it. And the highlights you might be looking for are things like what happened with the new format for the conference. So if you'll remember, if you read the advertising, there was a, um, a partnership with the Open Source Initiative and Red Hat, the, the Linux vendor, and that partnership resulted in day one being Open Summit, was, which was almost like a separate event back to back with two days of an Aperio conference, which made our conference a little shorter. And so some people who signed up for the whole thing, you know, kind of thought, am I going to get anything out of this Open Summit? Because it sounds like hardware geeks, you know, and operating systems and stuff. But amazingly, I attended the whole thing, the whole Open Summit, and, um, I thought the content was perfect for our community as we go through this era where people say open this and open that, you know, there's open educational resources and open software and open communities and what does open really mean? So if you didn't have that solidified in your mind that um, open means that you can build it and share it and make it different and when you make it different, you can't keep it as something that belongs only to you. You take your different version and you contribute it back. And and the, it just keeps going on and on. So we had a keynote for that Open Summit by the CEO of Red Hat. And he was talking about open education resources. Um, they had a video that they showed that is probably circulating out there on the Internet about the value of open and I think that our Aperio participants who were there, you know, we have a better idea of what open means because of that. Um, thank you, Jim Whitehurst. That was, yes, and he wrote the book, The Open Organization, which was also fascinating because of the values we have as an Aperio community, right? We're all about um, contributions. I mean, anybody can be... I hesitate to say this. All right, I'm going to say it anyway. Anybody can be a like a biggie in the community just by the contribution you make. And the rest of us recognize you for your contribution because that's huge. I mean, we, we all put in and make something bigger than any any one individual of us. So that was pretty cool. And I think I'm going to stop there and I'll jump back in if uh, I think of anything else. I just want to concur with Laura's comment 
intense because I did not know what to expect with the Open Summit Day. Um, and was I was delighted with the content and the speakers, and it really set a, a tone for all of the conference in the remaining days. So I thought it was great, and I'm looking forward to the next year. That's awesome. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Tricia. I see that Mark is on the call, and he has got his microphone. I see some folks from Walsh University are on the call, and they've got their microphones. Were any of you guys at the conference as well? And if so, did you guys have thoughts that you might want to share? Uh, uh, this is Mark from Brock. I, sadly, I wasn't able to make it. I um, was uh, able to get to Baltimore last year and um, uh, glad to have joined the, uh, the BOF uh, in relation to the TNL group. And uh, I'd just like to say that it was an excellent opportunity to connect with everybody. Um, as you said, Matt, to put um, faces with names and uh, I think just get a sense of the wider community. Um, so going's great. Uh, I certainly regret that I wasn't able to, but uh, yes, uh, still glad to be on this call. <clears throat> That's awesome, Mark. Thank you very much. And Sawa mentions in the chat that it's great for her to hear that the Open Summit contributed to the continued vibrancy of the community. I did not get to attend the Open Summit because I was coming up on the train that afternoon and I didn't get there quite in time, but I definitely agree, Salwa, that that was really what I heard over and over again from folks, not just from Trisha and Laura, but from a lot of folks that the Open Summit was really, really good about really getting a lot of people more excited uh, about what it means to be a part of an open community. So I definitely will not miss it next year. I will make sure that the train gets me there on time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Matt, that, that could have been my fault, but, um, and if it was, I apologize. But um, one of the other things I commented in the chat is that anybody can check out the hashtag Aperia16 on Twitter for all the postings that went on during the conference. A lot of um, people captured some interesting uh, presentation slides on, you know, cameras and posted those um, with lots of commentary about speakers and concepts and ideas. And um, it it's one way that you can sort of go for the kinds of things that were discussed and, and presented. Absolutely. I know there were some folks who were live tweeting during Jim Whitehurst's presentation. And in fact, I was following some of that as I was on the train coming up. And it was really the next best thing to being there, that those folks did a great job of capturing a lot of the stuff that Jim was talking about and the ideas that they were having in response to his talk. And that was really cool. So I would really encourage people to check out those tweets if you haven't already. I see that Neil has posted a question here in the chat. Other than the Open Summit, what was the most surprising thing you learned at the conference? This is a, a great question. Uh, maybe I'll start by talking briefly about one of the sessions that I really enjoyed, uh, which was a session from two instructional designers from the Claremont Consortium of Colleges in California about the advocacy, defense, and evangelization of Sakai. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Claremont, uh, Claremont is a consortium of seven different schools uh, that share a large campus and that share an overall organizational structure, although they are separate institutions to some extent. And six of those seven institutions are Sakai schools and have been Sakai schools since 2006. And even though these schools have been Sakai schools for about 10 years at this point, they have been constantly asked to evaluate other LMSs and engage in LMS shopping. They've done that, they said, every two years or so since they adopted Sakai. And they really gave a great presentation on how to navigate that process and how to navigate the LMS shopping process without fear um, and in a way that 
allows you, the group that's managing the LMS, to, to maintain a lot of control and a lot of understanding of how that process should work and, and allow you to move through that process and explain to other people, faculty members, uh, other ITS or CIO staff members, what Sakai is and why Sakai is really a great choice. And they talked about different strategies that they have used, uh, for example, just comparing basic statistics uh, like uptimes and the amounts of funds that would be required to move all of their data that they've been able to preserve in Sakai to another LMS. They talked a lot about how they use those statistics to really show people just how well Sakai is working for them. And I thought that was a really, really interesting presentation. Obviously, you hear from a lot of different people, from a lot of different corners, rumblings about, well, there are other LMSs. There's LMS X on the horizon or LMS Y on the horizon, and they're doing this other thing, and our CIO is thinking about moving to that. Well, these guys gave a great presentation um, with some tips on you know, how to be involved in that whole process and, and work through it and come out with a positive uh, solution. And I think they're going to make that PowerPoint available um, so that we can all take a look at it. And maybe in the future, over the next few weeks, we might want to invite uh, some of the presenters that presented at Open Aperio to do some virtual sessions for us. Because I think there were a lot of great sessions, and I think that maybe you guys uh, who were not able to attend, and you guys who were able to attend uh, might want to hear those again. So there's my two cents about that, and now I'll pass that off uh, to some other folks. Neil, I mean, sorry, Matt. Um, we're almost the same person. That's totally okay. <laughs> you might as well be the same person. Um, <laughs> I was also at that evangelizing and advocating Sakai session that Claremont gave, and I agree it was it was super interesting to hear their perspective. And one of the um, comments, I'm not sure if it was theirs or uh, someone else in the room, um, but it, the point was raised that no one listens to their own people. Um, decision makers want to hear about. Um, things from someone else who are somewhere else. And um, I, I raise this because this goes back to the user stories um, and how that can be an effective way of um, sort of influencing um, decision makers at institutions who are considering a new LMS or other tools. Um, and then also infographics was emphasized as a great way, you know, it's a visual, um, easy to digest um, message about um, a feature or a system or, or what have you. So um, another thing to consider if you are looking for ways to, <laughs> that's okay, Terry, you can scroll. Terry said infographic or fit on the screen. But yes, you can scroll. And so um, uh, I, I personally enjoy infographics a lot. Whenever I see them, I'm always checking them out. I want to see how they're done, you know, how the information is presented. Um, I'm a very visual person, so uh, I find them meaningful. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to uh, add on to what you were saying, Matt. Infographics. I found a great way for an idiot like me to create a cool infographic. Canva.com. I found that too, Laura. I know. It's <laughs> fun. It's fun to play there. Yeah. I was playing with that just the other day. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see. What else? Um, oh, let's see. One negative. I gotta. I gotta throw this negative in. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to see any of the presentations by any of the Atlas Award win winners, and I wished I had. Uh, I hope that. Well, and we didn't do any uh, any uh, videotaping uh, this year. So, if they don't Louisa, make up, a... sorry to interrupt, but Louisa said she videotaped all of those sessions. Really? How yes. do we get 
how do we get our hands on them? I'm sure she plans to um, share them. She even talked about um, presenting them here in the, te in the, you know, over time in the teaching and learning calls. So, um, or at least sharing them via some, once she gets them posted somewhere. So I think, I think we'll have an opportunity to see those. Oh, good, good. Um, so let's see, Anil's question was the most surprising thing I learned, Su most surprising thing. I think the most surprising thing to me was how uh, well advanced Xerti is. Xerti is that um, Nottingham and uh, a couple developers from the Netherlands, they've got a pretty big community of developers and they've been around for a number of years, but they're, um, when you looked at their interface of, th this would be like an alternate, not even an alternative to lessons. It's more robust than lessons because you create uh, learning objects. So you can create um, a couple questions to put in, a video to put in. You, you can create the content there and then it's um, available to be presented in you know, multiple situations. It can't, there's embed code, you could embed it in Sakai. Uh, it, it's, uh, it can be exported as SCORM. You could, if you have your Sakai instance SCORM enabled or you use SCORM Cloud, um, uh, they can also, their platform, Xerti, is, is a web-based client. I mean, you don't install it on your desktop to make these things, so you could also just play it there. And, um, They've really come a long way since the last time I saw them just a year ago. They're on they're on version three, and they're even talking about some newer features to um, to make it more adaptive or more personalized. In other words, have different um, flows and sequences through their content based on whether you passed a test or watched a video or or whatever. And they're working, Tricia, they're, I think they're working first on XAPI. Right, that's, that's right. He said that that's where he was right now, but um, and then he's going to be also investigating Caliper for um, integrating those learning objects into Sakai. Well, those two, though, yeah, those two standards are for returning the data that's collected to a learning that's record right. store. Yeah. That's so, right. um, and the reason I know that is uh, we have a learning analytics initiative here at Notre Dame that's in pilot stage. And my colleagues, Xiaojing Duan um, and Patrick Miller uh, did a presentation, but it was on the same time as this panel that I was facilitating. So I didn't get to see it. But Xiao Jing, I understand, knocked it out of the ballpark by um, working with our infrastructure people at Notre Dame to get um, to get our demo pilot version available at the, on the NYU network, so that she did a live demo, and uh, and it went off without a glitch. That's right. And Salwa mentions that one of the Atlas winners was a Zerdi project. Um, and suggest, or Terry suggested this would be a good teaching and learning topic. So I totally agree. Um, live demo shutter. <laughs> I know she she really had gumption to do it, but they they pulled it off. And what they were demoing was um, the tools that they've put together to display in Sakai some of the some of the metrics um, that they glean from analytics data. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Terry, yeah, that's you really asked cool. if this was if Zerti was like Lectora or Storyline. Uh, yes, I think Zerti is along those same lines, where you create learning objects in which you can also um, quiz um, students as they're going through and learning, and it branches and so forth. So similar. One thing about this, Terry. The one thing about Zerti, though, the advantage would be. Since it's integrated into Sakai, hopefully, is the gradebook connection. Because when I use Lectora, I can't do anything with gradebook. They're working first on the analytics part before they do an LTI connection to Sakai. 
Um, so that's not quite, when I think of integration, I, I think of something tight like an LTI rather than embed code or SCORM. Yeah, but, but there are going to be multiple methods. And that's what I'm hoping for in, in that kind of tool. Yeah. Well, this has been just an awesome discussion. We've got like five to six minutes left, and I wonder if maybe we might want to take just a couple of minutes and take any questions, um, any other questions that either attendees or non-attendees might have um, that we want to bring up and discuss maybe as we kind of wrap up here. Tricia comments in the chat that maybe we could give an update um, on the teaching and learning birds of a feather, uh, which Tricia and I led and had some nice discussion uh, with some folks who attend those calls regularly, uh, like Adam Hawass, it was great to see him there, and then also some new folks, uh, some new faces. So that would be great. Uh, Tricia, do you want to give a couple of thoughts about that? Sure. I had a browser open to, I thought, um, some of that. Let me find my notes. There they are. So um, we, we actually had a pretty good turnout at our session and some folks who uh, didn't regularly attend were attend, you know, don't regularly attend our calls were in in the BOF and uh, so that was great to have some input and one of the main questions that I asked uh, and wanted to get feedback on was what do people want out of this teaching and learning community and so several suggestions were raised that um, I thought had some merit and one of those was asynchronous ways to contribute and um, so obviously we have our email list um, you know we talked about the possibility of um, using the Confluent site to, uh, and we do all, do some of this already, that, you know, having our presentations, we record those, any papers or PowerPoints might get uploaded there, um, or a Google folder to share docs, things like that. Um, people asked about time zone issues. It's something that has come up on this, uh, on our calls before, and I think we're doing the, We've arrived at a at a time that that works pretty well for most people. Certainly not everyone, so that's unfortunate. But what are you going to do? Um, Asynchronous. Did you come up with any ideas about that, Tricia? Well, that that was some of the things I was just discussing, like the having information from our live calls also available in the Confluent site as, you know, and then communicating that to uh, people via the email list. Um, Any thought of using Slack? Oh, uh, I'm going to add that even though that wasn't raised, but uh, yeah, that is an excellent suggestion. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that to people not on the QA is that um, the um, now, what, 91 inst uh, individuals at 10 institutions who've been helping with Sakai 11 QA have gotten into an Aperio Slack domain, and we have different, I don't think you call them rooms, channels, call them different channels there. Uh, so some of us have enough experience. It's It's just like a chat client. You can raise a question and any of your colleagues, your peers who are online can answer it in real time. Yes, and it's really an effective tool. I, I love it. We have pretty much adopted it in our own um, Sakai team here at the University of Virginia. And, um, and I know that the Aperio community has also adopted it for a lot of the different um, groups as well. So yeah, we should we should have a teaching and learning uh, Slack channel in that. Can we do that, Neil? Well, once we once we get through all the bureaucratic red tape. Okay. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Well, I think anyone can I think create we just did that, right? <laughs> What's that? What's that? We just we just went through the red tape just now, right? We just went through the red tape, right? I think I think any I don't think it has to be me. I think anyone can set up a channel if oh, you try okay. it out. Like, say, I did not because I, I, I think that would be more empowering if people realized they can set up their own channels, you know, rather than thinking, oh, it has to get approved or something. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if we had to be an admin or have some special status. Try it out, and if you can't get, you know, I'll, I'll set it okay. up. But I'm pretty sure you can. Okay. Will do. Um, the question was raised whether we should involve more faculty in these meetings. Um, maybe have invite faculty to talk about their early adopter experiences. Or, and again, the Atlas winners come and present. I think that would be really um, awesome to invite them to come and present on what you know, their topic that they won. Uh, people liked, like being on the mailing list, and that's great, but we don't really do a lot in the mailing list other than talk about our upcoming meetings. Um, some folks noted that it's difficult to have uh, live conversations online. Um, some people are on chat. Some a few people are on the active mic, um, and I know that's a challenge. Sometimes you're in a place, your office might be in a place where you can't really, you're not comfortable coming on the mic, so you're you're you just listen in and chat. Um, you know, it is it is a challenge, but I think uh, we overcome it to the best of our ability. I, I I'm not sure if anybody has felt um, severely impeded to participate in conversation if they if they can use the chat versus the mic but um, I don't know what we could do about that so those are just some of the the ideas that came out um, that we might consider one request or one idea was also to have a mobile capability for big blue button uh, so that people who might be traveling in their cars can still listen and participate, but um, if they are not at a desk. Oh, that's true, Dave. So we should emphasize that as well as a way to participate. Okay, so that's, that's it. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. That's that's a great summary, Tricia. Um, thank you very much. I think the one thing that I might not add, but just emphasize uh, something that I believe Charles Bristow uh, from Illinois State suggested was, you know, the idea of using either our Confluence page or Google Drive or Box or or something as a hub where we can store shared resources um, that we have acquired or we have created, you know, in the course of doing various work that might be of some value to other people in the community. Um, for example, you know, Dave Evelyn was very kind to share uh, some of the custom CSS that he has been working on, that he has used in lessons, um, so that other folks in the community, uh, like the UVA folks, um, could prepare a demo and just show people in the learning design community at UVA how that customs feature works. Um, high five, Dave. Absolutely. That worked out great, by the way. Um, and if we could create a place, a shared space, where we could keep a lot of those resources, I think that people would share even more, um, which would make the community, getting back to some things that Laura and Tricia and Saul were saying earlier, even more uh, vibrant and active, uh, which would be really, really great. So. I think that any suggestions that you guys might have, any preferences that you guys might have about a particular app um, or software that we might want to use for that shared space would be welcome because I really think um, that we want to set that up. And Laura says to Dave that she feels left out. So I'm sorry, Laura. We did not mean to exclude you. We love you and you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so we've got just about four minutes left here um, to talk about um, some upcoming topics, and we've had some great uh, suggestions already in the course of this conversation for some upcoming topics. I mentioned briefly the possibility of inviting some presenters from Open Aperio to do some virtual sessions uh, for us in the upcoming weeks, and some people indicated that they were interested in that. Is that something that more of you would be interested in? And Neil points out we do have um, an LTI roundtable, which is a great idea, uh, and a course development roundtable. Absolutely. And Tricia um, asks about the possibility of one or more Atlas winners. I think that's a great idea. That was something, and Tricia may have mentioned this in her summary just a minute ago, and I may have already let it pass out of my head, uh, that some folks in the BOF mentioned that they would like to hear more from faculty. They'd like to hear more about specific use cases. Um, that would be a great thing. Uh, Sawa suggests that we invite the Zerdi winner to come. I think that's a great idea because I would love to hear more about Zerdi. Um, and Terry mentioned that just a few minutes ago. She'd like to know more about Zerdi. I think there's a pretty universal interest um, in learning more about what they're doing. So that's great. So that gives us uh, some things to pursue here in the short term and some great opportunities for some great sessions um, coming up. Any final thoughts or comments or questions? Uh, Tricia volunteers uh, to reach out to see if maybe the Zerdi winner uh, can join us next time. And that would be wonderful, Tricia, if you're able to do that. That would be great. And Terry uh, points out uh, that the 10th anniversary of LAMP um, is either coming up or has arrived, um, and how to work with and establish collaboration between institutions. I think that's a great, a great topic, Terry, and I'd love to hear more about that. Is that something that you might be interested in taking the lead on, putting together something for that? Okay, that would be that would be great, Terry. If you don't mind either kind of thinking about that or uh, or asking Martin, that would be great. Okay. Well, guys, this has been just a, a great meeting. Um, we've had a lot of really great discussion um, about some things uh, that were really exciting from the conference, and I hope that we have transferred at least some uh, of the excitement that we felt and the energy that we felt being there uh, to the rest of you guys uh, who weren't able to be there, and we hope um, that we will be able to see you there uh, next year, if not before. Um, it sounds like several people are going to be at LAMP, and so there will be people who will be there, and they can get some energy and bring that energy back to us here. So that's even better. Um, so we've uh, got a lot of openings for sessions upcoming, but we also have a lot of good ideas um, about sessions to fill those holes. Um, so that's really great. And Jennifer asked in the chat any idea about what next year's uh, Open Aperio dates might be, um, and Neil has not heard anything specific about uh, date or place. Uh, there may or may not have been a campaign to just try and name Toronto as the site of next year's Open Aperio. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Laura, Laura Sierra from Notre Dame may or may not have just started sending out tweets telling people that she was looking forward to seeing them in Toronto. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how far that campaign is going to go, but that would be fun. <laughs> grassroots, let us start it. <laughs> exactly. This is a grassroots campaign. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Neil likes Toronto. Neil says that he doesn't have much influence, but that is, of course, a lie. So if Neil likes it, then that's a good start, and I feel good about our chances. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, but it is 11.01. Um, thank you guys so much for sticking with us today and engaging in some great discussion. And we look forward to seeing you guys at our next meeting, uh, which will be... 
two weeks from today, Wednesday, June the 15th. So have a great day, everybody, and we will see you very soon. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Bye-bye.